This is Dr. Mary Chamberlain, and I am here with Susan Kennedy at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. Today is Monday, July 10, 2017. I'm interviewing Ms. Kennedy as part of the Oral History Project, The Early Years of AIDS, CDC's Response to an Historic Epidemic. Susan, welcome to the project. Do I have your permission to interview you and to record this interview? Yes, you do. Susan, your career as a CDC laboratorian spans some three decades. It began only three months before the June 1981 publication of the first MMWR report on pneumocystis carinii pneumonia among homosexual men. Your work and that of your colleagues under the leadership of the late Dr. Stephen McDougall resulted in some of the early seminal discoveries and publications about the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. However, before we talk about your CDC work, let's talk a little bit about your background. So could you start off maybe by telling us a little bit about where you grew up in your early family life? I grew up in Rome, Georgia, which is about 70 miles northwest of Atlanta. I have two older brothers and a younger sister. Uh, my father worked in a hardware store, and my mother had various part-time jobs when we were little, and she later ran for the school board in Rome and then decided to run for the city commission. Yeah. She was the first and the only woman during her time uh, to, be, uh, to be elected to the city commission in Rome. A real so, pioneer. <laughs> yeah. She was a, a, a real activist. So. Interesting. So with all of that influence, um, I guess it, in terms of decisions about going on for college education and all of that, uh, where did well, you go? Where did I you study? I saw uh, my science teacher, and I, I think when I was a senior, showed us a movie, and it was about various professions in, in health, hmm. and there were some of the allied health professions were highlighted in this. And so one of the things that was in the movie was medical technology. Hmm. So I just got really interested in that, and I decided that's what I was gonna do. So I uh, started at Oxford College, which is part of Emory, oh, right. mm -hmm. with the intention of going on to Emory. My father had gone to, had gone mm -hmm. to Oxford and Emory. But I had a partial scholarship at Oxford, but I was not gonna have that at Emory. And so I was borrowing money to pay for school. And Emory's med tech program was a five-year program. Oh. So I looked around and I ended up at the Medical College of Georgia, which had a four-year program. So I could finish a year earlier and at a lot uh, less expense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's where I finished, was at the medical college. So it sounds like you were, your early years were influenced by some very strong women. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess so. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. They were ahead yeah. of their times, actually, when you think about it, with now all of the emphasis on STEM-type studies and getting encouraging women to do that. So, Yeah, and my mother had been a science major in college. Oh, had she? Yeah. Uh -huh. In, so. in microbiology? Well, or? we used to joke that it was just called science back then. She mm. said it was more chemi mostly chemistry. Yes, chemistry. And my older brother ended up being a chemist. He worked for Eli Lilly. Oh, gosh. And retired okay. from there. Well, what uh, got you to, to CDC? How did you end up getting to CDC um, after you graduated? Well, the, my first the job out of school was the only job I ever looked for in my whole career. <laughs> All the other jobs just were presented to me. But I started at Eggleston Children's Hospital. Oh, sure. And after about, I'd been there about two years, I got a job offer from the hematology oncologist at Emory, Dr. Ray Gab, who wanted somebody to work in his research lab. And he had approached the lab director uh, and, she, and had asked for a recommendation. So she had given him my name so I was never sure if she really thought I was the best person or this was her chance to get rid of me. And, uh, but anyway, he offered me the job and I took it and we had, I worked in a lab. We, we, across the street from Grady Hospital is where the lab was. Okay. Okay. After I had been there about five years, Bonnie Jones, who started this at Eggleston the same time that I did, left about the same time I did and came to CDC. 
So over the years, she would call me when there was a job opening that she thought I might be interested in. And a couple of the times that I think she called, it was gonna, the job was gonna involve animal work, mostly mice. And as was very clear, I did not want to do any, any animal work, even mice. So she called me about this job and she said, you know, you really need to come and see about this one. It's with the arthritis, you'd be a guest researcher Hmm. paid by the Arthritis Foundation, but you'd be working for Steve McDougal, who is this really great guy, and so you really should talk to him. So I call it, went, I talked to Steve, and he just offered me the job just because Bonnie had recommended oh, me. Oh, gosh. And we were, had been operating at Dr. Ray Gabs on a five-year grant, and the grant was about up, and I wasn't sure it was gonna get renewed, and there were two of us who worked in the lab, and we were also about to move to Emory into a trailer. And that didn't sound very good to me. So I decided, by then I knew a lot more about CDC. And in fact, I had been to Bonnie's lab hmm. because Dave Gordon was the, their branch chief at the time. And his, he, they were doing this big study on adult leukemias. Hmm. And they were doing some of the same tests on the, with the adult leukemia cells that I was doing with the pediatric leukemia. So I had, I had come to CDC to learn how to do some things in, in that lab. So I decided that you know, that'd be a good move. I would, I would at least get to CDC, and then if there was a federal job that opened up, I'd be, I'd be around to hear about it and you know maybe switch again. Gosh, it sounds like it was very well timed. The various events that were happening yeah, sort of they coalesced just perfectly. Fell in place. The stars yeah. aligned, as they as they say. So, tell us a little bit. You, uh, expand a little bit. You said this way you were a guest researcher working f for the Arthritis Foundation. If you could expand a little bit about that, and and maybe tell us a little bit how that fit into to Steve McDougall's lab. Uh, well, Steve McDougall was, by training, a rheumatologist. A rheumatologist, okay. Yeah. So uh, Fred McDuffie, who was the medical director of the Arthritis Foundation at that time, he and Steve and a, another rheumatologist, Ng Tang, who was, I think, at Colorado, they got together and formed a, a, a committee hmm. with some other rheumatologists to address the need for standardized reference sera for anti-nuclear antibody testing. And these tests are used to distinguish people who have uh, various rheumatic diseases mm -hmm. like lupus, Sjogren's, mm -hmm. uh, the mixed connective tissue disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have these antibodies to the nuclear proteins. Okay. And there were, people were testing for the protein, for the antibodies, but no one was sure they were testing the same thing because there weren't a lot of commercial tests. So they decided there was a real need to have well-characterized standards that people could, could order free mm -hmm. of charge, and then they could make their own in-house standard that would replicate the standard that we sent them. So it really started from scratch. There, they, we didn't have the equipment that I needed and the, the, the techniques were not set up. So it was a matter really of setting the lab up. Mm -hmm. I know I had, we, one of the things that we did to, to do the fluorescent testing that we did was we needed frozen sections of mouse kidney or liver. Oh, the animals. <laughs> and yes, here we go to the animals again. I made clear to Steve I was not working with animals. But anyway, I had to find, a, we needed a microtome, a cryostat microtome to make these frozen sections. And I, I'd never so done this before. that's a very fine knife, yes, if you will, to yes. cut tissue or I, tissue blocks. I had never done this. Hmm. But we, we found one that uh, pathology had surplused out to the warehouse. CDC used to have a warehouse, and if you had lab equipment that you weren't using anymore, you sent it to the warehouse, right. and then you could like go shopping at the warehouse. That's right. That's right. And if you found something that you needed, you'd say, yeah, I want this, and they would transfer it and bring it to your lab. So we found this old cryostat, which we had delivered to the lab. And I just read about you know, how you do it and just I, I can't remember if I even talked to the pathology people because they were they would have been in our same uh, our same 
a division at that time. But I think I just learned just trial and error. It's just a matter of trying it. And I would just get another person that worked in the lab and worked with mice all the time. Sheila, it's okay. And I'd say, I need a mouse liver. She would just go and bring me one. So I didn't have to even see the mice. She'd just bring me the liver. So it was, it was a that is setting up the other types of tests mm-hmm. uh, and getting them. And then it was a matter of screening the sera that these rheumatologists would send us. Okay, so you they would get send us candidate, okay. yeah, aliquots of candidate sera. And then we would, if we picked one, it would, we'd send it out to all of them and they would all test it. So it was, you know, everybody on the committee tested and we'd come to a consensus if we had a good candidate, and then they would get a plasmapheresis from that person, and then we would, then we aliquoted and lyophilized and did all of that here at CDC. And by the, after about two years, we had, we had five standards. The lab was up and going, and we'd already had like 300 requests. I mean, as soon as it was available, people were requesting it. So these were five standards for five different diseases? Five different rheumatologic uh, diseases. antibodies, yes. Five different antibodies. Right. Gosh, I had no idea that that pioneering work was done at CDC. Yeah, and the standards today, at last, last count, like in 2013, they'd sent out almost 30,000 vials. So CDC to this day is still yes, doing that? Yes, they're still available. Gosh, okay. And are the, were these also helpful so a lot of these assays are commercially available now? Yes, yes. So was the, the work that you were engaged with really the foundational work that allowed manufacturers to, to, to take this and move to development of commercial assays? Well, the commercial assays you know, that we have now are just, well, we just didn't, they didn't, weren't in existence okay, when I was right. doing this. Uh, the way they do things now is completely different, but they can still use the standards. I see, okay. If they're testing for the antibody, they know that this is, this is, oh, this is a, a well-characterized a well- source of antibody. Oh, so they, okay. So, and the commercial companies were allowed to get five vials a year, whereas an individual lab, we would only give them one vial. Oh, okay. Okay. So all the commercial companies that made the test, they did use our standards. Okay. We've sort of alluded to this a little bit uh, and, I'm, and, and um, in some of your comments, and I, I was wondering if you could sort of set, set the scene for us a little bit in terms of 30 years ago, CDC and your domain, the laboratories, were pretty different kinds of places in terms of the equipment and things that we now consider to be just very ordinary or basic probably weren't even in existence then. And I was, I was just wondering if you could cast your mind back and think of some examples of, of things that, you, like in this instance, you were building from scratch, but or, or what some of the differences are. If we walked into a laboratory 30 years ago, how it would be different from one today. Well, I think the first thing you would notice is there were no computers. You can't buy a piece of laboratory equipment nowadays that doesn't have a computer that runs the that runs the equipment oh, in, instrument. PCs that weren't even invented. That's right. We had uh, CDC had a this huge mainframe computer that was in the sub basement That's sub right. or the sub sub basement <laughs> of building one. You know, this huge took up the whole room. Had all mm-hmm. this special cooling and everything. And I think I recall, as I recall, we had like one dummy workstation on the whole in the whole branch, and it used DOS. And you would sit there if you needed a printout, you would enter all your information in this DOS format, and then you submit it to the mainframe. And mm-hmm. then, sometime days later, they would call you and tell you your printout was yeah. ready. And so you'd go get these huge big Were these rings. the big rectangular ones? Yes, the with white the, stripes. all the white stripes and all, all the little you know, holes in the sides. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that's what we would get back with our data on it. So that obviously, yeah, that, that the advent of computers completely revolutionized uh, laboratory and will work among many other things. But we was, there was really a lack of any automation. We just, really? we didn't have a simple things like a, a plate washer that washes 96 well plates that are used in all mm-hmm. ELISA assays. Uh, the pipettes were just single volume pipettes. 
everything was glass. We That's even right. had we had glass pipette tips right. for some of the pipette that we had mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you don't find glass anywhere in a lab now because mm. of the risk of breakage mm -hmm. and you know Cuts. cutting yourself but everything was glass back then they were just the plastic industry had not there hadn't been a demand for it because we used reusable glass that was washed washed that's right that's right I wonder if you could orient us a little bit bef before we go into talking a little bit about some of the HIV work sort of orient us organizationally, uh, where you were Steve McDougall's uh, laboratory branch, whatever wa fit in, in with CDC at the time, because you were part of a larger division. Right. See, I was paid by the foundation, but CDC provided lab space and everything else. Right, so all of your work was physically on So I was in the CDC. lab with the, everybody that was mm -hmm. doing the other things that Steve was doing, and he was an immunologist and a rheumatologist, so he was doing research on, uh, you know, rheumatic diseases. And, and we were within what was called the Division of Host Factors. And the labs, they, I think CDC had been reorganized just before that, because mm -hmm. it used to be the Bureau of Labs, all That's the labs right. were together, all the epi people were together, and then they decided that they needed to merge and put the epi people with the lab people for their disease. Well, we were immunology, there was pathology, immunology, hematology, and I think the drug services might have been with mm -hmm. us. We didn't fit with a disease, so they just kind of put us all together and was called the Division of Host Factors, and Bruce Evett was the mm -hmm. division director. And Steve was uh, eventually the branch chief. When I first came, Dave Gordon was still here. Okay, okay. But he left probably within that first year that I was here. He left, and so, so you Steve were became the branch chief. In the immunology branch, I guess? Immunology branch, yes. Okay, okay. Um, so how did how did Steve McDougall's lab first get involved in, in any HIV AIDS related work? Because you're, you're arriving three months before the first MMWR and just beginning to do this work on developing standards for rheumatological disease testing. So, but it's not soon after that that things start to percolate in terms of these unusual cases popping up. So I was just curious how, how Steve's lab first got involved. Well, the, one of the first things that they noticed about people with the disease at that time was their immune system was really messed up. And that's why they were so susceptible to all those, those mm -hmm. uh, pneumonia and the other diseases that they were getting, other infections. So Steve was sort of the de facto immunologist at CDC, and we had a, uh, a fax, a fluorescent activated cell sorter. The only one at CDC was in... Uh, Steve's lab, and Jan Nicholson was in charge of that activity. And they had been, been using the facts because they'd been studying leukemia, and so they'd been, they had been looking at subsets of lymphocytes. Mm -hmm. And so they came to us, the, the samples just came to Steve's branch because we had the capability So these are samples from that. AIDS patients that clinicians sent in? Yes, the samples people? from Los Angeles, those very ah, first samples. From L.A.? From L.A., and then the, later the ones from New York. New York. Came to CDC for, you know, for, for, to be evaluated. So the, these blood samples would come in, and you and your colleagues were to run them through this f fax, this, is this the same as a flow cytometer? Yes. Okay. So can you explain a little bit about what, what that would do, uh, how a flow cytometer is, what, it, what it's basically doing? What, what would you come out with in terms of a result? Well, a flow cytometer is an instrument that uses lasers mm. to enumerate and identify particles or cells that have been tagged with a fluorescent dye. So the, in the case of the lymphocytes, each of the subsets of lymphocytes has unique proteins on their oh, okay, surface, sure. and they're named for those proteins. So a CD4 cell has a CD4 on its surface. CD8 has a CD8 on its surface. Well, you can buy antibodies that have a fluorescent tag mm -hmm. on them to these specific okay. proteins. Okay. So you would take the antibodies, add them to your cells, and then they're aspirated up into the, into the instrument. Mm -hmm. And the fluidics of the instrument are such that the cells pass 
through the laser and the detector in single file, one cell at a time, but thousands of cells per second. Oh, wow. So it counts millions of cells, so you give very accurate count. And the, the one that we had, the first instrument we had, was the cell sorter. So in addition okay. to identifying and counting the cells, it would actually sort those cells, cell by cell, and give you all the CD4 cells in one tube, the CD8 cells in another tube. Your, your okay. And it would, so it would then be able to also give you a count. You got a count and you got your sample back also. And you got your sample back. And okay. it was, since it was the only one at CDC, other lab groups would have need occasionally for a cell sort. So they'd contact Jan and we had, Dave Cross was an operator of the machine and later Carolyn Dawson. Mm -hmm. uh, they would do the cell sorts for anybody at CDC that needed it. Oh gosh. Now, um, what were, what were some of the findings from these early samples that came to you when you ran them through the fax machine and looked at the different subsets, if you will, of, of T lymphocytes? What were, what were the findings that were Well, what out? was astonishing is that they had no CD4 cells. And these are also known as, are these the, the T helper cells? The T helper cells. None. Right. They had very, very low numbers. Had you seen anything like this before? It was very rare. I mean, I'm sure there, there are some immunodeficiency diseases, mm -hmm. but this was just so dramatic. And it was the same, and it was the common factor. Patient after patient. Patient after patient was the lack of so the, of the CD4. So very few, if any, CD4 or T helper cells. What about the CD8 cells? Well, that ratio would be flipped. So there'd be a lot more of right. them yes, than the helper cells. Yes, compared to the CD4 cells. Gosh. Um, now, I, I, you moving on, so th these were, were there in the community, apart from CDC, were there other laboratories around the country that had these cell sorter machines? Yes, there were research facilities. So there that were had research them. facilities yes. that have them, okay. But nowadays they're very common. They're very common. And eventually we had to buy more, and we just bought more just of the, oh, okay. of the, of the cytometers. We didn't need another, okay. we didn't need another uh, uh, well, separator. But. I, I've heard the story that because your laboratory had the only one at the time at CDC, that it was uh, became a bit of a tour highlight for VIPs that came to CDC and got a tour of the laboratory, including former President Jimmy Carter. Is that's, that correct? That's correct. Yeah, Be because it was the only one. It's a very it was a very impressive machine. It's huge it was, because it has these lasers in it, oh. and it also is water cooled, so it had pipes and it had you know, tanks, and it was, had all these, it had dial, lots of dials, and a screen. It was just, you know, it was a very impressive machine. Hmm. So visitors, if they were at all interested in what CDC was doing with this new disease, they'd bring them right in to show them the flow cytometer. So there was actually a picture in the uh, Atlanta Journal-Constitution oh. of Steve, Jan, and uh, former President Carter Standing in front Gazing of Gazing in awe. Yeah, standing in, <laughs> standing in front of the, the machine. Of the cell sorter. Well, so then taking it a step, a step farther here, as long as we're on the subject of T cells and CD4s, um, you and your colleagues undertook a series of experiments that provided real insight into how the HIV virus infected these T cells. And I was wondering if you could describe that work because there was a there was a lot of interest in people had no idea how it was that the virus was well there attacking, was because you said there were no cd4 cells or right. T helper cells so well when you when you did a culture with these the cd4 cells died very quickly really in culture and i think that that was was one pro and it happened you know within within a week or so and the, and if you measured the cd4 on the cells the it, it went away. You couldn't see it on the cell anymore. Uh, and we did a paper of a later, like in 1985, 86, that actually proved on a molecular level hmm. that CD4 was the receptor on the cell and GP120 was the protein on the virus that actually attached. 
there was there was other evidence that those mm-hmm. were the proteins involved, but uh, the experiments that we did really became the definitive proof that that was that was mm-hmm. what the interaction was. So the HIV virus has this glycoprotein, and that's what GP stands for, glycoprotein, and the 120 is its molecular weight. It's molecular weight, and it's that protein that specifically is hooking onto, if you will, the CD4 site. That's the sort of the docking, I right, guess, station right. almost. Right, like a lock and key. Like the described. lock and key. So for the many non-laboratorians that will, that will be reading and listening to this interview, um, tell us a little bit, I mean, this is, this is elegant work that you and your colleagues are doing, and I'm wondering how is it that you devise these various experiments? Do you all sort of sit around and talk through ideas, go try some things, see if it works? I'm just curious how, because you're on the cutting edge, uh, new virus, new f- acting in a very strange way, killing off people's CD4 cells. So how did you devise these experimental studies? Well, I have to give the credit to Steve McDougall. You know, he was he was a brilliant man, mm-hmm. and he had a way of seeing things that other people did not see. Mm-hmm. And when you have you you, there was evidence that CD4 was involved. There was evidence that GP120 was involved. So Steve just said came up with this very. It was really very simple, and not that difficult to do. We labeled cell. I mean, you want me to yeah, say talk how? Yeah, a little bit about it. Yeah. We we labeled the surface of of a cell line that has CD4 on it with a radioactive tag. Okay. Then we infected it with virus. Okay. And then we did what was called an immunoprecipitation with an anti-HIV antibody. Mm-hmm. And then you develop, you do a Western blot, and then you develop this on a piece of X-ray film. And so what that antibody pulled out of that mixture was a 58 KD protein, which is the molecular weight of CD4. And then by by the molecular weight and the controls that we had, we knew it was CD4, and that was the only thing that was there. Okay. So then we did the reverse. We labeled virus with the radioactive material, infected cells, and did the precipitation with an antibody to CD4. And the only protein, the only thing that showed up on that x-ray was the, we, we measured as 110, but it later on it, it was, was more refined. accurately measured as 120. This glycoprotein. But with our little ruler and molecular okay. markers, we, we okay. guessed at the wrong weight. But. Okay. So. But nobody else had thought to do it this way. But you know, Steve just he would so just he come up it. with and would he run original, it by would he talk it through with with me? Yeah, he'd, he'd talk about it. and the other thing is you had to you read every journal that came out. Okay, I mean everything about HIV we read. We had the the, the journals would come. Mm-hmm. It was Steve subscribed to some of them, but they'd be in the library. Okay, so you read everything that came, that was published to to mm-hmm. figure out what to do. And there was the other thing about Steve is he. He had like a photographic mind. He Mm. remembered everything he read. And he would tell me, go to the library, look up this article in the Journal of Immunology by so-and-so, and and I want you to look at the figure, see how they did this, and look at the figure. It's at the top of the the right-hand page, about halfway through the article. You know, you go and that's where it would be. So you would see methods that what other people were doing. And it was that, and then just, coming up with sort of uh, improvising on just improvising and we didn't have the reagents we needed but we had animals we could make our own antibodies we could conjugate them uh-huh. and S- S- Steve never believed buy- in buying anything you <laughs> could make it yourself so they were goats and uh, rabbits and mice these are CDC goats yeah and they rabbits. had them out at the farm at the farm and uh, we had mice in the in the, know, in the building six I think it was uh-huh. or whatever but we just, you know, immunize them, collect their blood. Collect the and antibodies that they produce. Then, it, you know, I could purify the the antibody and tag it with whatever we needed, a fluorescent antibody or okay. a hydrogen 
proxidase or whatever we needed. Okay. So we, you made your own reagents and you just figured out trial and error how to do it. Did Steve do bench work himself? He or? loved to be in the lab. Okay. He was always happiest if he were in the lab working. But you know, unfortunately, he, would, he became the branch chief. And he would have been a lot happier if he'd just been left alone. Uh -huh. He would have been pr probably more productive mm -hmm. if he hadn't had to take on the administrative, the administrative duties that he had. But he was always happiest in the lab. And he, he avoided his office. <laughs> He would always be sitting in the lab. He'd bring his papers or everything. I mean, you didn't have a computer or anything. You wrote out every article, every journal, mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. you, a manuscript. You mm -hmm. wrote it out by hand and had the secretary type it up. But he always found a spot in the lab, usually right across from me, mm -hmm. uh, and that's where he would sit. So he, as he had to take on more of these administrative duties, you obviously carried out a lot of uh, you, his, the, the ideas that he had, you actually implemented or, or made happen. Yes. I mean, he would help if it was something that needed, mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. needed more than one hand to do. But, mm -hmm. you know, it was, and the way the lab was set up, people sort of had their specialty of what they did. Oh, okay. And you know, there were people who did flow cytometry. I myself never did any flow cytometry. Mm -hmm. If I needed my cells uh, identified or whatever, I would I'd just say go to Bonnie Jones or uh, Sherry Orloff and mm -hmm. you know they would just they would do it for me. Okay. Uh, but nobody else uh, did the did Western blots but me. And oh, I, talk I to you did a lot of cell culture and I mean I mm -hmm. was sort of I don't know, I was just sort of Steve's hands I guess. <laughs> Well, and I should say probably that, a little know, bit more than that. <laughs> if he were here, he would he would be the one to do this mm. to do this interview because well, I'm really I'm really I mean this is all his work. So. Oh, I have a strong sense though that you were a very good team. We um, were a very good team, and we were very good. We became very good friends. Uh huh. So. Uh -huh. Well, this this work that that Steve and you did in terms of really, I, it sounds like it was provided sort of the the definitive proof that the virus via glycoprotein 110 or 120 hooked onto the CD4 cell. This was written up in Science, a major scientific journal, uh, and it was, it was, I think, hailed as proof that, that, uh, that uh, CD4 was the receptor for HIV. And as I said, what, that 120 was the viral protein that bound to CD4. Uh, it won CDC's Charles Shepard Award that's presented to the best manuscript on original research that's published by CDC scientists in a peer-reviewed journal. And I also read that this science paper wa was cited in other publications more than 120 times during the first 18 months after its publication. Um, why was this such an important finding? What were the implications of this work? Well, the implications were that if there was some way that you could stop this, block this binding, okay. yeah. that you would prevent the virus from infecting the cell. Okay. So, so that, that, I think, probably gave people a ray of hope that there, there were, this was one of maybe multiple approaches to try and stop infection or manage infection. What, what was your reaction? It's you and Steve's reaction to to all of all of this. Well, it, science did a pre-release to the newspapers before the journal actually came out. Ah, okay. So it was already in the press before anybody had even read it. And I, this was not something that Steve was. Uh, he was not at all interested in any attention from anybody. Steve was not a media hound. <laughs> he was not. He was the most humble person. He didn't want to take credit for anything. He always said the credit goes to, you know, the people that are doing the work. You know, I'm just supervising. I'm just, you know, it was always everybody else that deserved the credit and not him. And he was horrified. We had reporters just calling the lab. Back then, the switchboard would just pass them through. Oh, God. There wasn't the, the press office and all that that CDC has now. So we said reporters call his office 
he wouldn't be there because he's hiding out in the lab because he, he knows his office phone's going to be ringing. So then the, the secretary's directing them to my phone in the lab. So I'm having to answer <laughs> the phone calls from the reporters. A uh, trial by fire <laughs> with the media. <laughs> and he, Steve said, he said, that's it. He said, I am never sending another paper to science <laughs> because I don't want this much attention. You know, we'll just, we'll go to a different journal if we ever, if we ever have anything like this again. And he was on, a, he was on other science papers, but he himself is lead author. He never sent another paper oh to science gosh, after that. True to his word, true yeah. to his word. He did not want the attention. Well, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what you said was your particular area of sort of specialty expertise, the Western blot. So first of all, you have to tell us, what is a Western blot? <laughs> well, a Western blot is an electrophoresis technique used to identify proteins, and in our case, antibodies to those proteins. And it's called a Western blot because the first method, the first test that used this sort of methodology was developed for uh, DNA sequencing. And oh. the man's name was E.M. Southern. So the opposite of Western, Southern. Oh, Southern. Or not quite the opposite. So the next test for, our, for DNA as was called, they, as a play on Southern's last name, they called it a Northern blot. So then when the Western blot was developed, I think, in 1979. As a continued a little lab humor, it was called a Western blot. And later, there was a, an Eastern blot, and that's for lipids and carbohydrates. Ah. So they all the procedures, all of these, met, all these blots are a two-step procedure. Okay. They use a gel to separate components, and then they do the trans-blot or transfer, a second electrophoresis, to get those components onto a piece of paper. Okay. So in, the, in our Western blot, we took disrupted virus, and in this case, we used LAV because we LAV never... The adenopathy virus... Yes, it, from the French. From it the was French. the French isolate from mm -hmm. the Institut Pasteur mm -hmm. because uh, the NIH would never send us any. Oh, how interesting. Because so, they had the HTLV-3. Right. They had what Gallus. they thought was, you know, the their virus. own virus. It turned out later they were exactly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, the French, the Institut Pasteur did send some. They sent it to the virologist at CDC. And they knew that we, Steve had been saying, you know, we need some, we need some, we, mm -hmm. we know, we've got this blot. Steve had the blot set up to look at uh, antigens in, in immune complexes, mm -hmm. antigen antibody complexes. So the technology was there. Sandy Browning had set the, the equipment up, and we had learned how to do it from Victor Sang, who was in parasitology. At, at the CDC time. parasitology. And he was, already, he was already doing Western blot because before us. For other, I mean, you can use it for anything. It separates any proteins. Because this, if I can interrupt you for a second, this is at a time when there's no diagnostic test for the virus. No, correct. There is no test. You're culturing. This was the You're virus was CD4 discovered, cells. you know, mid 1983. Mm -hmm. Towards the end, I don't remember if it was the end of '83. Now, by this time, I had taken a job. I had taken the job. Somebody had left. Sandy Browning left, and I was hired. Oh, so you were a, an so FTE now, at long yeah, last. So Not now I'm, I'm, I'm a CDC employee okay. at, working in HIV. Uh, so Sandy left. So I, you know, I, I learned how to do the Western blot before she left because that helped me get the job because they could say that was a requirement. Oh. You know, for the job that you somebody knew how to do that. But anyway, I'd gotten hired like in September. So I think it was either like December, maybe January, sometime early '84, we got the virus from oh, the French okay. through mm -hmm. the virologist. I'm not sure we got some of the first one vial that they sent, but we did get some, and that allowed us to grow it. And then we could make our own. Oh, okay. So we, as soon as we had the virus, we lysed it with a detergent and heat to disrupt it into the various individual proteins. proteins? Okay. You take that disrupted virus and you put it on top of what's a gel, and in our case it was made out of polyacrylamide. Mm -hmm. And because of the detergent that you add, all of the proteins have a negative charge. So you apply the, the electrical current 
to this apparatus and the proteins will migrate towards the positive bottom of the, of the gel mm -hmm. and they separate out by molecular weight. Uh -huh. So the lightest ones go all the way to the bottom and the heavier ones stay okay. towards the top. You then take that gel out of, the, out of that apparatus and you put it next to a piece of, of paper, specialized paper called nitros, made out of nitrocellulose. Mm -hmm. You put that in a second apparat electrophoresis apparatus and you apply the electrical current and it pushes the proteins out of the gel onto the piece of paper. Okay. So then you have a piece of paper. With so you all, can visualize. We can't, well, they're on there. So the proteins are on there, you can't see them yet. Okay. So then you cut that piece of paper up in multiple strips and you take each little strip of paper and you can incubate that with your, with your sample your serum sample. From the patient. From the patient. And that has antibodies which will stick to the proteins. Okay. You add a secondary antibody that has an enzyme so you can add a substrate and get a color. So what you get is the color precipitates out. So you end up with a piece of paper with multiple bands mm -hmm. that are each of the individual proteins. Each and the then the proteins are named by their molecular By weight. their molecular, so hence we were talking earlier about GP110 GP or GP110, 120. 120 and 41, 24, the various okay. proteins. So, so it didn't take us long to get that okay. because we knew how to do the procedure. It was just okay. a matter of figuring out dilutions and how much virus and, and with that, that all went pretty quickly. The problem was, what do we call a positive? positive. Because when you develop the, the first test for something, you don't have anything to compare it to. There mm -hmm. were no other tests. Yeah. So how do you decide what's a positive? Do they need to have an antibody to every one of those proteins? Do they, if they have antibody to only one protein, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Does that mean mm -hmm. they're positive or negative? And so we had to figure that out, and the only way we could figure it out was to just start testing samples, collections of samples that CDC had on people that were uh, assumed to be positive full blown AIDS. So would because you start they had these symptoms. Full blown AIDS patients? Yes. Okay. And then compare it to, nor to people, normal controls. Okay. And so it was a matter of testing and evaluating the test. And it's pretty, it's, it's difficult to do because what you want is for a test like HIV, it needs to be as close to 100% yeah. sensitive and 100% specific as you can get it to be. Yeah. And note, there's not a test that has right. both. So you have to give up one or the other mm -hmm. of those. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you want to be sure you have no false positives or do you want to be sure you have no false negatives. negatives. In the case of HIV, either result is, is equally bad. You don't want to tell somebody they're positive when they're really not. And you don't want to tell somebody that they're negative when they're really positive. Because back then, you told somebody positive, it was a death sentence. Mm -hmm. You're right, right. So you had to be right. So. so. Can you give us any idea of how many samples you tested? I mean, how many test runs did it take of testing sera from AIDS patients where you felt pretty confident that you could see the same pattern of the bands that, that would This pop took out? a while. And what we would report back before we were sure, we would, we would just tell whoever the investigator was, because all the samples that I tested were in, were done in conjunction with an ep epidemiological study. Oh, okay. We weren't getting samples from the general public. Oh, I public. see, okay. All the samples that we had collections of samples, particularly hemophiliac samples because Bruce Ebbett was a division director and he, he was, his, the, he did a lot the of coagulation in disorders right. were his specialty. So he had these collections of samples from mm -hmm. hemophiliacs from all over the country. He had serial samples from the same person collected over time. over time. So those were some of the first ones that we tested. Oh, okay. And we actually found our first positive in 1978. Oh, what are the hemophilia yes. patients whose sample you had that was drawn in 78 was positive as far right. back then. So yes. yeah, so that's uh, three years before the first MMWR comes right. out where right. the disease starts to be recognized clinically. But I mean, that's, I remember that block because every year there were more and more by 83, 84, they were almost all positive. The, the, I think the first, the the first large collection of 
hemophiliacs I tested, over 70% were positive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But is, we used these samples that were, they had, that they knew something uh -huh. about the person. Uh -huh. And if whether they were asymptomatic. So you had good clinical correlation. Had cl a clinical correlation. So we sort of, now the samples when I got them, of course, were completely blinded because it is, in the end, the reading is subjective. You have a person, you're sitting there and you're looking and you're trying to decide if there's a band there, if it's dark enough I see. to call it positive or not. And you could have two people look at it and somebody sees something you don't see. Mm -hmm. And so it's, there's not a machine that reads this. This mm -hmm. is a, just human eyeballs looking at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you just, it just, I just tested and tested and tested. Now, was CDC the first or one of the first laboratories to, to, to demonstrate the utility of Western blot testing for HIV? I don't know. I, I think other people were using it. So other it. people might have been working on yes, I think developing other the Western blot. And, I, and, and NIH focused very quickly on trying to get an ELISA assay. And nowadays, I mean, we fast forward and it's interesting um, because the first if you're going to test someone for HIV, typically you would test an ELISA antibody, and then the Western blot would be used as a confirmatory test. Well, nowadays they're rapid tests. Oh, that's true. <laughs> they <laughs> come up to you can do you know, current you can do history, them in, right? You can do them in 15 minutes, and they're they're rapid tests that are that are much better than any ELISA or any Western, Western blot. blot. But the Western blot did become the gold standard yeah. test, and the the criteria that we that we started using actually was the criteria that was used for it was you know, 30 years. So all of this work that you did on it sounds like hundreds, thousands of specimens thousands. and just looking at the banding patterns and then figuring out what would be the very highly predictive bands to say, yep, if you've got this band pattern on the nitrocellulose paper, this is a definite, well, we're going to call this a positive Western blot. Gosh. Right. And the ones that, I mean, for a long time, we would just tell somebody the most frequent uh, result that we didn't know what to do with was somebody would have a, a band would show up at P24. Now, when the virus prep itself, there's more P24 protein than any other protein. So if you were going to have any kind of cross-reactivity or stickiness from an oh. antibody that somebody had to something else, it's likely where it would stick. Oh. And so you, you would, that's where you would maybe get a false reaction. I see. I and see. those, we would just tell the investigator. You know, Can't tell. P24 positive, we're not sure what that but means. no other bands at that. No other bands. Okay. So it could have reflected completely unrelated to HIV or possibly very early HIV? Very early or very late. Or that's very the other early. thing. When, you're, oh. when you have AIDS in stages, you have no antibody because you have no T cells. Of course. So an in stage AIDS patient will look like somebody who's just who's been early recently on. infected. Did, did this work serve as, because now these Western blots are commercially available. Correct. They became commercially available in, not until 1987. Oh, so several so years later. From 1984, ours was up and running in 84. So with the, with the commercial labs be interacting with, with you, with CDC, in their development process? Steve was never interested in trying to do anything commercially. Okay. But Victor Sang in parasitology the, did mm -hmm. work with the commercial companies in the development of their blot. Oh. I mean, we'd learned the, Steve said, well, you know, Vic should get credit for this because he taught us how to do the blots. So, I mean, he wasn't doing HIV blots, but he taught us the technique. The technique. So, that so uh, he just, you know, Victor did it. But Steve never, he was never interested in pursuing anything like okay. that uh, commercially. Did you ever use commercial blots or did you always use your I growth? never used a commercial. <laughs> Uh, I never used a commercial block. And I, now, again, I say our, the, the studies that I did, the samples were all in conjunction with an epidemiological study. study. There was another uh, routine serology group under Jerry Shockettman's mm -hmm, group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I had Charles Shabel was the, uh, mm -hmm. first Richard George yep. was head of that, and then Charles Shabel, uh, that did... Uh, they never just got samples from the general public, but if there was a question about a mm -hmm. diagnosis, they could uh, request that CDC look at the sample, and that still goes on today. There's still the, 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 the lab group, the immunology group, 
still will get samples from state health departments who can't figure out figure a diagnosis. Out. Well, speaking of state health departments, so, so your work examining hundreds, thousands of these specimens and figuring out ultimately um, sort of diagnostic criteria to call a blot positive or not, then wasn't it the next step to push out this testing to state public health laboratories? We did, we did do that. The, the state health department, there were some, some of them, I don't know if they had, if any of them had blots set up. And, but they needed, so even, the license came out in 1985, but they needed to be confirmed. So people were sending samples to state health departments asking for confirmation tests. Well, they didn't have anything. So we taught classes, Vic Sang, Marianne Simon, uh, Kathy Hancock, Steve and I, and uh, mainly Shelba Whaley from the training lab at CDC. We taught classes to uh, state health departments. And I think we had somebody from almost every really? state health department that came. Now, sometimes they would send the, the lab director would come, and that was not always the best <laughs> move because this was a this was a wet workshop, and they had to cast gels, they had to they had to do the electrophoresis, make the the transblot it onto the paper, cut it into strips. I mean, they had to do everything. This was so they could set up this whole procedure in, in their, their own lab when they got home. And some of these lab directors, you know, they hadn't been doing <laughs> lab work in a while, so so how many? So, so they're learning these skills under your direction and your colleagues' direction. So are, there, are they in your laboratory? The, How back, many can you fit in at a time? Back then there was a, a training. There was a lot of training oh. going on at CDC. So there were labs, the, the training, I don't, I don't know if they were a division, or I guess it was a division of training. They had these labs, and they just you just used it. Oh, so you sort of stock it up with the yeah, particulars so that you they, needed. Yeah, so they bought the, all the little apparatus. I used these large gel formats mm -hmm. that, you know, they were very big, but they we used, went to a very small gel format for them. But they uh, ordered all of the equipment. They would have everything that you just give them a list of what you needed to teach the classes, and they would get it all in there, and they would, they would help make the reagents and whatever you needed. But they had these labs, that's all they were used for, was just training. A fantastic resource. Yeah, yeah, that was. And I mean, it's a shame that CDC doesn't do that anymore, but they don't. Gosh. Um, did, it sort of reminds me of high school chemistry. Did you have any interesting, uh, did everything go smoothly in these classes? Everything did not go smoothly in these classes. I, I learned very quickly that you have to be very clear about mm. instructions. Because I would, if if you can do something wrong, somebody will do it wrong. When you've got 25 people who don't know what they're doing and have never mm -hmm. done anything mm -hmm. like this before, there are a lot of mistakes made. The, I mean, the, we had people. The, the nitrocellulose paper, you can't touch it with your fingers. You have to use gloves because you fin get fingerprints oh, on yeah. it. Well, it comes with this between two sheets of this blue paper. Well, we had people who would throw away the white paper, which was the nitrocellulose <laughs> paper, and they would be trying to transfer their proteins onto this blue, just backing paper that was nothing. <laughs> but the worst thing that happened was we had a, we actually had a fire in oh. one of the, the, you're using a lot of current to move these of proteins course. around, right. and it gets very hot. And if you use the large gel format, you have to have a cooling apparatus, you have to have a cooling coil to okay. keep it cool. But in the small ones, we just you run it for a shorter time because the gel's shorter, so you don't have to run it this long. But we cautioned everyone, big, you know, underlined <laughs> caps. Be sure you cover the, those wires with buffer to keep them cool. Cool. Okay. Well, okay. somebody didn't cover theirs with the buffer, and that wire just gets red hot, and it it actually <laughs> caught on fire. So the well, fortunately. We were in the classroom at the time, but there was somebody in the training lab, and they saw it, and started yelling. So we just we went in there and unplugged it, so it didn't didn't burn the lab down. <laughs> but it was it was it was pretty exciting. To have I a would fire. imagine uh, that, that hair raising, and then when people would go back to their individual public health laboratories in their state, I'm guessing you that you all got a lot of follow up questions too once they. 
I don't remember getting mm -hmm. that many mm -hmm. follow-up questions because uh, we taught the classes in 86 and in 87 the commercial kits came out and the, the kits come just it's just the piece of paper you just uh -huh. put your antibody in your sample with the incubate it with the piece of paper it's got everything in there that you need secondary antibody so I don't know how many I have no idea how many state health departments actually set up and ran blots mm -hmm. I, I never got any of that feedback. Okay. So, I mean, if they if they'd had a question, they probably would have called. Uh, Big okay. Sane. So you didn't actually have to go out in the field. Everybody we was never, coming yeah. to no, you. No, everybody came here. We did not go to the field because we had so many people that needed training. We, you know, mm -hmm. were fifty state mm -hmm. health departments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we had two classes of twenty five people. So I wanted to circle back a little bit um, on some of the studies that were done in in of. Uh, AIDS in persons with hemophilia, um, because as you mentioned, Bruce Abbott, the head of the division of host factors where your branch was situated, uh, was, was someone that had worked a lot with the hemophilia community before AIDS. He was very involved in these clotting disorders, blood clotting disorders. And um, so, and, and you mentioned that you had access to samples for individuals over a period of time, so you could actually watch these individuals if you will, um, become positive, be negative, negative, and then turn positive. And I think you mentioned an astounding um, observation that the vast majority of these persons with hemophilia ended up acquiring HIV infection. And that was because? That is because for their treatment, they received one of two things. They either received a cryoprecipitate which is made from a single donor. So it's giving them the clotting factor Yes, the clotting that, factor. That, they, that they're missing. Yes, they're missing. And, or they would get uh, what's called a concentrated form of that. And that form, and the concentrate is made from hundreds of donors. So if you got the concentrate, you were ex every time you got that, you were exposed Concent to hundreds, hundreds of people. Of so you'd be exposed to thousands of people. people. And we showed very early on that the rate of positivity was about three times higher uh -huh. in patients who just received concentrate right. versus patients who had just received cryo. Those samples came from the Puget Sound. Oh, uh, up in blitz, Seattle. Yeah, in Seattle. They had, these, they had samples where people had only received concentrate, had received mm -hmm. both, and had mm -hmm. only received cryo. Mm -hmm. And it was a dramatic difference. Hmm. And even the very the first very first paper that came out that we published was about hemophiliacs, and it was correlated with the fact that they had received these concentrates. Concentrates. Cryo. So that in turn uh, led to another key piece of research coming out of the laboratory. I don't think you personally were involved in it, but this was. The, the quest to find some way to inactivate the virus in the factor eight concentrates, these concentrates that were made up of individual donors, the hundreds of them in, in a bag of concentrate. And so someone want, we need to figure out a way to inactivate the virus because it's a life-saving product for these people. They need it. On the other hand, it's, it's killing them <laughs> right. at the same time. Yes, Steve uh, and uh, Bruce Abbott got a couple of the companies, Cutter and I think Alpha mm -hmm. was with the other was the other company that participated was willing to participate in the study, and they Steve figured out a way to do a heat treatment that would not harm the factor eight mm -hmm. that they needed, but it was enough to kill the virus. So he, you know, this was. This was published, and all of the companies, you know, they immediately adopted this. I think the Canadian companies were a little slower because I think later there were some lawsuits. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I remember Steve having to go testify oh, gosh. in Canada mm -hmm. about it, that they didn't do it right away. Mm -hmm. But it essentially stopped the AIDS epidemic in hemophiliacs. hemophiliacs. And uh, Steve always said that was his greatest accomplishment. Uh, well, and with good reason that he would say that. Um, so that was. I mean, it saved thousands, thousands. of lives. Gosh, and it and it, it's interesting, as you say, it was picked up immediately and implemented 
oftentimes these things take a lot of time to crank through it. It sounded like this was just taken on board very quickly. Um, well, I think that's because they got the companies involved well, in the from beginning. The get. I mean, they knew that they had to do something. Uh huh. Uh huh. Now, in addition to certainly, this was a, a, a huge victory, if you will, to to find a way to inactivate the virus in a product, a life-saving product that that patients had to have. But there are there were a lot of qualms in general about HIV. Uh, in the environment, and be it at homes or hospitals, and and lots of questions about well, how do we decontaminate a surface? How do we kill the virus if it's on our laboratory countertop or or in our kitchen? If if we're in a household with people with living with HIV, and you did some of the work that looked at ways to inactivate the virus with household bleach. Yes, we had. Uh had uh, come up with a, what we called a capture assay, but it was mm -hmm. a way for us to quantitate virus. And we, we some of Tom Spira's uh, lymphadenopathy, unexplained lymphadenopathy patients agreed to give us large amounts of blood. Okay. And we could get the, get antibody, made antibody from that. Okay. From their, from their serum. And then we could tag that antibody with you know, a color producing agent. Mm -hmm. And then we, so we had this capture assay that we developed. And once we had that and could quantitate virus, then we could do things to the virus to try to kill it. And oh, then we could okay. use our capture assay to determine if we had killed it or not. So uh, uh, some of the early, we looked at bleach, we looked at alcohol, we looked at all sorts of things. And Linda Martin did a lot of those, was in charge of a lot of those studies. And uh, Sheila is okay. Uh, was doing a lot of those experiments, and I think Sherry Orloff probably did some of those things too. But uh, they were able to show that you know bleach was was a good killer, and that's why everybody started disinfecting with 10% bleach. But you alcohol not so good. Yeah. Alcohol is mm -hmm. dry. You have to have, have to spray it on and let it dry. It's okay. not doesn't kill it instantly, like the bleach does. But you and your colleagues had to figure out the concentration, you just said 10%. Right. And so this assay would allow you, so you would be testing various concentrations of bleach against a known amount of HIV, and then you would start diluting? Uh, yeah, you just expose the virus to the different dilutions. Dilutions of, and. And then you would uh, measure the amount of virus that was there, and, and would, it, it, what you'd get was how many logs reduction. Logs reduction, okay. There, there were, okay. was in the titer. You okay. knew what the titer was to begin with. Okay, and it 10% was the dilution? 10% is the dilution that you needed. Okay, okay. But you, I, I'm just, um, it's it's always, I, and I remember this coming up as a, as a question, it's, um, it's, it's, how do you satisfy, I mean, what you want to make sure is that you've killed every last bit of virus. And so how, how would your capture assay be able to? Well, we couldn't say it killed every bit of it, but you could say it reduced it by 10 logs. Ah, okay. So, or six logs, or okay. five, or three. You could tell that what the log reduction was. Okay, okay. So. Now, I know your laboratory was also involved, this was not early work, but I know your laboratory was also involved in yet another experiment where people were interested in uh, determining infectivity of, of the virus and in, 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 in its inactivation. And, um, and it went by a very curious name, the Killer Tomato Project. So I, I really must ask you about the Killer Tomato Project. How did that come about? We got a request from the FDA who said that they had credible rumors that people with HIV were going to inject their blood into fruits and vegetables and to try to infect other people. So they wanted us to tell them if this was possible. If the virus would survive right. an injection. If somebody could get infected by eating this injected fruit or vegetable. And I guess tomatoes, because they're red, maybe the blood wouldn't oh, show up. Oh, how in yes. I think okay. that was one reason why the tomatoes came up. 
And so I, the request came through Harold Jaffe, who was our division director. I think it originally went through Dr. Roper, the CDC director. Oh, well, very high through, level. Yes, <laughs> high level, because this was one agency talking to another agency. So it got down to, to Steve's lab, and Steve <laughs> came in and told me about this, and I just immediately thought of that movie, The Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. <laughs> oh, okay. Like a, you know, B-rated movie or whatever uh-huh, that had uh-huh. been out. So we just laughed about it, and we thought, you know, this is, this is crazy. This is not something that we can prove one way or another. There's no way to practically do this. And so Steve just went, got back to Harold and said, we don't want to be involved in this. This is like a no-win situation for us because we can't, we can't, we cannot we don't know what to do to determine this. So I guess it went back to the FDA and then they suggested that we do some kind of study with pH. So the what pH we did. Of, of tomatoes or other vegetables. Right, so I had to go try to find out what the pH of a tomato was. And there's no Google, you can't just. Oh, because this is early, you know, early well, 90s. This is, yeah, this is mid 90s. There's no, there's no way to find out this unless you go read it in, a, in a, some kind of a reference book or something. So I was, the first thing I had to do, Steve, Steve said, we gotta find out what the pH of a tomato is. <laughs> so uh, we decided to do the, we do this pH study. And the other thing is like, this is gonna take us a month to do it. And was, Steve thought this is a waste of time, but it came back through Dr. Roper that we would do something. We were to do this. We didn't have any choice about it. So I did the pH study, which is not really that easy to do because you can't put low pH virus into cell culture because the low pH will kill the cells. It's oh. got to be back up to neutral. Oh. So what I did was just expose the virus to various pHs, and we did it at room temperature and also at four degrees because we thought you know the produce would be refrigerated, okay. so we'll do it at two temperatures. But then you can only expose it, but then you have to raise that back up, titrate that, back up to get it to neutral pH. So I had to do a lot of this preliminary titrations to know exactly how much to add because we wanted it to go down instantly and we wanted it to come back to mm-hmm. neutral instantly because we were timing this. And then we did our, our ID50 assay and capture assay and we determined the, uh, looked at the effect of pH. So we sent our, Steve sent the results back to Harold. And what were the findings? Harold. Well, the findings were really not that encouraging because <laughs> if it's refrigerated, the virus is really not that sensitive to pH. Now, there's a lot of other things that have got to happen. Somebody's got to eat that tomato right. and get through their, you know, acid yeah, in their right. stomach right. and every, you know. So lots of unknowns. We don't know that anybody's ever been infected from eating something like this. So it really didn't answer their question completely, but it's all that we could come up with. So anyway, we sent the, the, Steve just sent the results back through Harold, who was gonna send them through Roper, I guess, back to the FDA. So in that, in the letter. With the results. With the results is my reference in my lab book is SK, whatever the date was, something 95, Killer Tomato Project. Oh, this is how you identify the experiments. Yes, that's okay. how we identify these experiments in my, in my notebooks. We didn't have computers, notebooks. So Steve was just assumed that Harold would leave that out, that all he would do would be like send the graph, and he would write his own letter. Well, I think Harold just just forward it just the way Steve had written with that reference in there. And uh, I, we, what we heard was they were not amused that we had called this the killer, the killer tomato project. And they sent us back this very serious letter back to Dr. Roper, thanking us for our efforts. And they said it was something like, while we could have, we hoped for better news, at least now we can concentrate our efforts on certain foods or something like that. Did so. you test more than tomatoes? No. <laughs> well, we didn't te- we couldn't test tomatoes. All we could do was pH. P- that's that's right. Excuse the me. You're we doing couldn't the pH. actually do any any putting it in foods and trying to get it back out. Oh my gosh. Was that the end of your FDA? That was the last only the last <laughs> request that we had from the FDA <laughs> that I know about. Oh gosh. 
Well, you know, Susan, in preparing for this interview, I went back and looked at, at some of the, the papers and whatever that came out of the immunology branch. And I was really impressed, and especially after hearing you talk, this is incredibly tedious, time-consuming, very detail-oriented work that you and your colleagues were doing. And looking back, you realize that the immunology branch cranked out a lot of work in the early mid-80s in a relatively short period uh, of time. And I, I was wondering, I wanted to ask you, what was it like to sort of keep pace with that? To, it strikes me now that this must have just been a tremendous volume of work for a relatively small number of people. Yeah, I mean, I think there were, maybe we might have had 15 people at mm -hmm. the most, but uh, there was so much to learn. No one knew anything. So it was just every, it was just wide open. It was so easy to think up things to do. <laughs> and we had the samples, and we had very good principal investigators. Uh, early on, Linda Martin, and then later Allison Mall, Jan Nicholson, Tom Spira, and Steve. Uh, and a little, even later, a little later than that, Janine Jason. We just had, we had good people to, uh, they were just was it a very stressful environment? You know, I don't. I would not say it was stressful. We were busy. There was a lot mm -hmm. of weekend work. If you were doing these cell culture things, you had to oh, come in on the weekends course. because you just couldn't mm -hmm. do something in five days. You know, it would run over to the mm -hmm. weekend. So there were a lot of us that worked on the weekends, and uh, I don't remember that it was stressful. It was just urgent. I felt it was urgent. urgent. You know, I felt a real sense of urgency. You know, we needed to find out as much as we could. Testing these samples was just, it was sobering to think about how many people were infected. You know, you talk, people talk about mm -hmm. the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when you test a, a set of samples and 70% of them are positive, it's like, you know, we were s s really starting to see how big that iceberg was. was. Now, were you or your colleagues, um, were you ever concerned about a through a laboratory accident, acquiring HIV? Was that something that you worried about? Um, I myself never worried about it. Uh, I can remember, I mean, this is, you know, we were all like in our 30s, mm -hmm. people were having babies. I do remember, I, I seemed like I remember somebody got pregnant and they asked not to do any live mm -hmm. virus work mm -hmm. while they were pregnant. And that, you know, we just, that's mm -hmm. fine. They just, mm -hmm. you know, they did something else. I mean, there were other things. The branch was doing a few other things, mm -hmm. but it was mostly we became totally focused on mm -hmm. HIV. That is all we were, basically all we were doing. And we did early on agree, as soon as we had that blot, everyone in our group agreed to be tested by me every six months oh. in case somebody had an exposure that we didn't know about. You know, when you're in a lab, you're sort of a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're out in the field mm -hmm. where you might drop a tube or somebody move their arm when you're trying mm -hmm. to draw mm -hmm. their blood or whatever. It's, you're pretty controlled. So I, I personally, mm -hmm. I never worried about it, but I think other people, you know, there was concern. You had to be careful. And like I say, there was glass everywhere. True. It took us a while to get away from that. But we agreed to do the testing. So every six months, Steve and I would draw blood oh. from everybody in the branch. Okay. Uh, he would code them, just put a number over Anonymize them. Anonymize them. A number mm -hmm. and, and give them to me and I would test them. And we continued to do that until what was called the Serum Bank at CDC started offering testing to anybody because there were people working in virology That's with right. HIV also. But we had set up our in-house thing, and we did that until it was offered by the serum bank. And then I think everyone signed up. You mm -hmm. just got mm -hmm. a number. You go to the clinic anonymously, give them your number, and they would they drew your blood, and they would test it. So that was, that was again, very um, uh, with a lot of foresight to, to, to have a self-monitoring program. Um, to do that. Well, early on, you you know, we really weren't sure. We tried not to do anything where you would create an aerosol 
and we didn't yes, have very right. many procedures mm-hmm, that mm-hmm, would do that. And mm-hmm. it's not airborne. You know, you actually had to mm-hmm, somehow mm-hmm. inject it in you or or swallow it or whatever. But we had, you know, we had the eye washes then. We had uh, we had hydrogen peroxide by the mm-hmm. sink that you could put mm-hmm. in your put in your eye or you know we didn't really know what to do Steve said said just pour bleach on yourself if you cut yourself well that's not recommended I was gonna say people wouldn't think that was a a good thing to do not a good thing to do but we didn't know what you should do we just sort of we just we just made up these procedures about this is what you do if you get it in your eye if you get it in your mouth if you if you whatever this is what you should do you know now at CDC they have the antiretrovirals on site all the time if you have an accident, you, can you call 24 mm-hmm. hours a day, and you can get to those antiretrovirals if there is an if accident. There. Gosh, so you were so obviously you were perfectly positioned because it was your laboratory that developed the, the Western blot test to test for the presence of the virus. Yeah, so we could start in '84. So you could start so doing could this start. on your own. Gosh, that very yeah. As I said. It's, it took a while for the rest of CDC to catch up where you were in terms right. of organizing a systematic program of, yeah. of, of uh, for laboratory worker worker safety. Um, you mentioned that it was a relatively small group, about 15 of you. I couldn't help but notice, uh, looking at the science paper that, that, as I said, won the Shepherd Prize, that apart from Steve, it looks like everyone else was a woman. In the That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> David Cross worked with us early on. Uh huh. Tom Spira. Uh, but yeah, it was we we were all women. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, there were a few. There were several of us that were that were trained as medical technologists. Okay. And there there are not that many me- medical technologists in all of CDC. But there were some some people like mm-hmm. Steve mm-hmm. who immediately recognized. If you get a medical technologist, they know how to do lab work. Whereas you get a biology major, well, again, they may have done something, but they haven't done clinical. They haven't done clinical mm-hmm, lab mm-hmm. work, and the, you know this. He just decided, you know, the best. The, he wanted medical technologists, so there were quite a few of us okay. that were medical technologists in his group. So along the way, you've you've mentioned a bit about about Steve. Sadly, Steve passed away some three years ago, and so obviously we as you said, can't personally capture his stories for this oral history project. Um, Is there anything else you can tell us about Yeah, I would love to tell some Steve stories. Tell tell us some Steve (laughs) stories. (laughs) Well, I've said before, he was was brilliant, Mm -hmm. you know, and he had this way of seeing things. Mm -hmm. But he was also, he was so much fun. Mm. You know, he, if you, if you were there long enough, he gave you a nickname. (laughs) <laughs> Everyone had a nickname, and once you had your nickname, that was it. That's all he called you from then on. Uh, every morning, 8.15, he'd come around, try to round everybody up, get them to come to the cafeteria because he wanted coffee. <laughs> and you know, then at 11 o'clock sharp, he was back around trying to get everybody to go to the cafeteria for lunch. <laughs> 2 o'clock every afternoon, he's coming around, gathering up everybody to go for what he called treat in treat. the afternoon. And... You went because these gatherings in the cafeteria was like a lab meeting. Uh-huh. Everybody talked about what they were doing. So, okay, yeah. And, you know, and everyone, other people at CDC knew that Steve was going to be in the cafeteria at those times of the day. They might not ever find him in his office. He'd be hiding out in the lab somewhere. But they knew if they went to the cafeteria, he'd be there. And back then, there were, people didn't have any place else to eat. Mm-hmm. We couldn't eat in the lab. Sure. We didn't have a break room. We didn't have, you know, if you wanted, mm-hmm. if you wanted to eat, you had to go to the cafeteria. I mean, you could bring your lunch, but mm-hmm. you still had to go in there to eat. So everyone went. And there were a lot of jokes, I think, about Steve and all of his women. Because it'd be <laughs> Steve and just this a gaggle table of women. Of, <laughs> of women sitting there. But they were very important. You really feel like you missed out if you didn't go to if you didn't go to the one of these three times a day gatherings. So. That sounds really um, very 
inspiring for really good camaraderie and cross-fertilization yeah. of ideas. And other people. You saw everybody mm -hmm. else in the cafeteria. Bateria. The virology people would be there. The, yeah. You know, so it was, CDC was much smaller. I was going to say it was much and smaller. And just, you knew, the lab people all knew each other. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, and so. I mean, Steve just made it fun. He just made it so much fun to go to work. <laughs> Yeah, so there's some there's some trade-offs. I mean, now we have a bigger campus, more laboratory space, fancy machines, and that you said at the beginning didn't exist. You did a lot of it all by hand and making your own reagents and all of that. But uh, along the way, you ha it's hard not to think that some things were a little bit have been lost. You know, people right. talk about the silos that we all kind of form our own silos. Um, just a, a few questions in, in closing before we wrap this up. Um, are there any aspects of CDC's laboratory response that you think CDC could have done a better job of? Uh, it does, not know, necessarily, I guess, asking you to critique your own, your own work, but um, uh, just always, a lot of times when people look back, they say, ah, oh, you know, we could have done this, we should have done this, and I'm just curious if you've ever had thoughts about how things could have been improved. You know, upon. I felt like those early years, we were we were moving so fast. We were, yeah. You know, we were doing everything we could. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I don't know that the laboratory, our laboratory, could have really done. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we'd had another couple Steves around, we would have <laughs> uh, we would have come up with some other things. But we just we were a very small group. Yeah. And I don't. I just not sure. How much more we could have done. It would have been nice if somebody discovered the virus a little bit sooner uh, and given it to us a little sooner. <laughs> but uh, I think in general, CDC was, all of CDC was doing what they could. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know whose job it was, but it would have been nice if somebody had gotten more education out there and more awareness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that this epidemic was as mm -hmm. big as it was. Maybe if we'd had an administration that had shown some interest mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. in this problem but you know it was people that nobody cared about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it was basically gay men were left it was left up to themselves to educate themselves right. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now did the lab continue to do non-hiv work at the same time or did you ultimately just become an hiv laboratory the the arthritis foundation continued after I, after I left, Martha Bird came, and that activity continued. continued. But with a different but, people. Uh, I mean, we did, we did a few other things with, uh, because of Steve's interest in the okay. rheumatology, but no, we... Mostly HIV. And, and the hybridoma lab was under Steve at that time, where we made, they made the monoclonal, laboratory, monoclonal antibodies, and that activity oh. just stopped. Oh. Because we took over that lab because they had biological safety cabinets. I don't think I... Hybridomas. Oh, hi hybridoma. Hybridoma. Yeah. They make monoclonal antibodies, okay. and they'd make them for anybody at CDC. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So, but that, that activity was in Steve's uh, group, but that just that just stopped. Okay. We, 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 we just went all out for AIDS. Well, I guess, any closing thoughts? Is there anything else that you'd, that you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Or I want to I just try to think that I gave credit to the other people <laughs> in the labs, but uh, I, um, well, it's clear that that your group operated as a true team. We did, we did. Uh, uh, you know, and we had parties together, and mm -hmm. it was like a family. Mm. And thirty years you were in this family. Well, when I left, I retired January of fourteen. I was the last person from that original immunology branch that was still in the lab. In the lab. Marjorie Hubbard and Sheila is okay were still there, but they were doing more administrative things. Mm -hmm. They had not done lab, been in the lab for years, and Sheila had left and come back. Uh, Marjorie had been there the whole time, but she was not actually doing mm -hmm. lab work. So I was, really, I was the last. You were the, the last. last one. There are other people still at CDC, but they'd moved on. They were in a different disease mm -hmm. or a different mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. So I was the last laboratorian from that. Well, group. that's that's a that's a you were a huge uh, asset to have for, for CDC to have for 30, 30 plus years. So, well, Susan, thank you so much 
for sharing these stories, particularly these behind the scenes stories that don't often get told. I mean, there's the papers are out there, but there's a lot behind the papers and the work. So it's been a real pleasure hearing some of those stories. Well, thank you for including me in this project. And thanks to the, the people that are funding this project, because I think it's important to hear from people. Well, great. Well, thanks so much. <laughs>